welcome to all the truth seekers that have joined us today. I'm glad that you've decided to join this online community and hope you're ready to inhale some provocative insights that will inspire and change the way you do business. My name is Mark McKelsey and I lead the people and the projects that bring you insights, shopper trends, and next practices from Global Market Development Center and Retail Tomorrow. For the next hour, this infocast will make your lunch hour profitable by demonstrating just how the curiosity and the power of the consumer must be at the center of your strategy. In other words, the way you've done things in the past is not the way your future success will happen, especially in these days that we're going through. Retailers and brands more than ever must be adaptive and in constant flux in order to connect with evolving populations. So how you respond to this session is important. Without further ado, let's jump into it. I'm coming to you live from Colorado Springs and have Andrea Lay from IdealClick joining us from Seattle. Today's infocast is titled Driving your Amazon business through COVID-19 and beyond. Very appropriate indeed. We'll explore the brave new world of selling and best practices on e-com giants such as Amazon. And my hope is that you'll see where and what the consumer is buying in this new normal. With so many business leaders, owners and managers that I believe are on this call today, I think it's appropriate to say to all of you, if you don't know this already, that this pandemic is not something that we're all simply going to get through over the next few weeks or months. As a leader in your organization, if you're not already rewriting your future playbook on how to navigate the market, it's fair to say that you may be falling behind. We need to treat COVID-19 as a global cultural storm where very few of us can barely see the steps ahead of us. It's truly once in a lifetime change that will affect all of our lives, the organizations that we work with, and how and what we buy will be changed forever. So if we don't all become gerbophobes by the end of this pandemic, then at least self-care is going to be top of mind for the rest of our lives. So just think of the tectonic shifts that are taking place in the world today inside retail. I think these will have a, a strong impact with you. Prime members are going to the store more than ever, while those who don't buy online are now becoming Prime members. In the midst of that intersection, consumers are doing things they've never had to do before. Thinking about things that they've never had to face in their lifetime. Some are deep in skepticism while others hold on to hope that things will be just fine eventually. In the meantime, these new mindsets are influencing shopper habits that cause marketers to change their strategies right now on a daily basis. Here are some of the things that we're seeing in the market today. Food, drug, mass, and convenience sales up 20% in the first week of March. Predicted that 15,000 store closures will happen by the end of 2020. 34% of consumers are using BOPIS that have never used it before. Cleaning product sales up two, three, even 400% in some areas. Puzzles and board games are in the top 10 search list on Amazon. And it feels like the 1980s. We're even seeing home video DVD sales spike in brick and mortar again. 700,000 restaurants across the US are closed with no reopening date in sight. Pain relief and immune boosting OTC shelves are empty. Your Facebook feed is chock full of sleeping aid device advertisements. And finally, 85% of couples say staying at home is strengthening their marriage while well, 15% saying stuck with their spouse may lead to a divorce when this is over. These are definitely unsettling times and uh, that are really unprecedented that we're living in. And, but with every crisis, opportunity also presents itself for those who are seeking it. So Andrew, hopefully that's a good tee up. We're glad that you're here to tell us more about what's going on in Amazon today and what the impact is. What can our viewers expect to learn today? Well, first, thanks for having me, Mark. And today we're gonna to talk about some of the impact that we're seeing um, on e-commerce, on Amazon, and on our manufacturer community. We'll also talk a little bit about the six stages of the consumer of consumer demand, kind of this life cycle. Where are we? Where have we been? Where are we? And where are we headed? We'll talk a little bit about who the new consumer is. There have been droves of people kind of flocking to buy things online. Who are they and how do we talk to them? And then lastly, we'll share some predictions, um, both for Amazon specifically and then for consumer trends and e-commerce in general. Sounds great, I'm looking forward to it. 
Before we get started and dive in, I'd like to remind our viewers that we can take questions during or after the session by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll certainly get to those at the end of the hour. Um, please don't use the chat button, just the Q&A. That's where we'll be looking for that and having some uh, engaging conversation afterwards. So with that said, back over to you, Andrea. Great. All right, see everything all right? Um, well, so this is, first, welcome everyone, and thanks for signing up for this webinar. I hope that today finds you all healthy and happy <laughs> as possible, um, and that your coworkers and loved ones are, are also healthy, and also that your businesses are running as smoothly as possible, um, kind of given the current landscape and circumstances. We are certainly in some unprecedented times, and today we're gonna talk a little bit about that and what we're seeing and, and you know, trends we're predicting for the future. So we'll go over a little bit, kind of an overview um, of kind of what we're seeing in terms of COVID-19. We'll double click a little bit on the impact on e-commerce, Amazon manufacturers, and then we'll talk about some predictions and some opportunities. So first, a little bit um, about me. I am uh, a writer and a, and a keynote speaker. You can follow me on these, on these different um, social media platforms. I'm also a 10-year former Amazon category leader. Um, I worked across a number of different product categories at Amazon. In fact, I worked across 15 different product categories, so got some pretty broad experience there. And I've spent 20 years in retail, including uh, my first job in college selling shoes so lots of lots of experience um, with that. I'm also the co-owner, one of the owners, and vice president of strategy at IdeoClick. We're a managed services firm. We work with about 250 manufacturers on Amazon, and we run their Amazon businesses through our software and our um, and our, our strategy. And um, we're certainly seeing a lot of impact across that manufacturer base right now, which we'll talk a little bit about today. So first, um, some level setting. I think Mark did a really nice job teeing us up, but I think the things to, to focus on here are we're seeing some pretty dramatic changes in purchase behavior, um, not just on Amazon, but in general. You're probably seeing those in your own lives as well. But one thing that we know for sure is that e-commerce is playing an extremely critical role in servicing customer need through this pandemic and that you know, it's never going to be the same again. And just to start off with a little bit of infotainment, um, these are Amazon's, some interesting terms that came up in Amazon's top uh, searches in roughly the top 100 this past week. And I think this gives us a really interesting window into consumers' homes and, and, um, and what's really trending. So you can see people are starting to figure out how to work out at home, um, clearly trying to entertain their kids with board games and sidewalk chalk. Uh, I think I've talked to a number of people who've tried to give their own haircuts and I'm starting to see some pretty clever memes about what that might or might not look like. Um, and interestingly, Lego actually went down a little bit, um, you know, relative to January. Um, but I think, you know, it, this is really, um, really kind of helps illustrate the differences in consumer behavior that we're seeing and, um, and, and that there's a call to action for us to figure out how to address these. That's how we can do our part, is figuring out how to service the needs that consumers have today. So COVID-19 is certainly impacting every industry. I don't think I need to tell you that. I feel like I wake up every day and read the news and it's doomsday for airline travel and retail and the automotive industry and, um, and you know, the impact on pharma. And uh, so certainly impacting every industry. You know, but I think the degree of the impact really depends on the segment that you're in. And you know, as you can see here, if you happen to be an apparel manufacturer, high-end fashion, this is not a great time for you. <laughs> um, you know, I certainly haven't dressed up in a couple of weeks, and and um, and so that's you know that might be a more challenged category to be participating in. Whereas food and beverage is probably going to have pretty low exposure. IT software and services. Uh, technology hardware kind of depends on what it is. If it's work from home equipment, you're going to be doing pretty well, um, otherwise not. 
And I think that really kind of ties in nicely with these six consumer phases. So this is a Nielsen chart that we adapted to really kind of tie to the, the demand that, that we're seeing across these different um, phases. And if you look, you know, current work, our current state is somewhere, you know, depending on where you live in, in the United States, at least, is somewhere between pantry preparation and quarantine living preparation. And for some locales, possibly already in completely restricted living. In, we are in Seattle and um, I know a number of other states are as well. So you can see, you know, we have made the transition. And, and if you look at the, just the top search terms on Amazon a few weeks ago, they were all they, and they still are pretty predominantly face masks and things like that, but you certainly weren't seeing things like dumbbells and puzzles showing up on the list. Um, but we are exiting this phase of pantry prep where people are stockpiling food and we're moving into this quarantined living preparation and for some locales perhaps starting to move into restricted living. So we're seeing spikes in manufacturers who sell things like home office supplies, school supplies, and then we're starting to see things like home entertainment, toys and games, and, I, and exercise equipment. I think we'll continue to see this for a while as people get used to living at home and working from home and exercising from home. And then after that, which we'll talk about at the end of the presentation, is when we're really going to go and move into this phase of living the new normal. And what is that? And what does that look like? And what's, what are some of the permanent shifts that we can expect? But as Mark said, with every crisis presents opportunity. And you know, this is a, a really pivotal time for a lot of our manufacturers. We, um, you know, we spent some time this last week reaching out and, and talking kind of individually to the leadership at, at more than 80 or 90 of our clients to really get a sense of what's happening in their world. We service clients across all um, product categories on Amazon. And you know, these are some of the, the opportunities or some of the best practices that we saw. I mean, the first is just really pivoting your, your advertising, and this isn't just specific to Amazon, but pivoting your advertising um, and your messaging. If you're in a position where you're lucky enough to have product, pivoting that toward you know, really timely messaging around you know, value, pantry stock up, how this can help a consumer in their current, um, you know, in their current lifestyle. And then if you're one of the manufacturers, which I know are a lot of you that are inventory constrained, this is like a daily battle of figuring out how to redirect, at least on Amazon, redirect your paid search advertising to products that are both in stock and have short availability windows, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And if you don't have any inventory at all, it is not the time to take your foot off the gas, particularly on Amazon, because it'll be hard and expensive to earn that position back later. So figuring out how to transition to some upper funnel marketing is key. Supply chain, I've talked to so many manufacturers the last couple of weeks who are um, using this opportunity to either um, you know, rationalize some assortment and, and focus on producing you know, a, a more finite set of products that are uh, of critical need or figuring out ways to launch new products that are in the space that's really hot right now you know, around home sanitation. And then lastly, if you're in a lucky enough position to be able to have a handle on a lot of your inputs, figuring out some ways to drive some long-term plans here. I talked to one manufacturer last week who um, is, it, they are in a lucky position. They're in a high demand category. They have plenty of inventory. And so now they're really thinking about how do we drive some long-term plans, sustainable packaging, whatever that means for you. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, the impact on e-commerce. So first of all, um, I could bore you with hundreds of graphs I've found online about the shift to e-commerce, but I think this one kind of sums it up pretty nicely, where it basically everything that has gone away from stores is going online. And I know that's a real overstatement and it depends a lot on the category that you're operating in, but we certainly are seeing a major shift of sales from brick and mortar to online. Some manufacturers are seeing incremental sales you know, if you're in one of those high demand categories right now, you, those sales might be incremental. But most manufacturers are seeing some form of a shift to sales online. And Amazon's been heavily impacted by COVID-19. And if you read, um, there was a letter published that Jeff sent, I think he put it on Instagram too, to his employee base, but they are willing and in the process of pivoting their entire business to align with servicing customer demand through COVID-19. 
but they've been impacted in a lot of ways. Obviously, demand shifts across their assortment um, pretty dramatically. You know, I don't think that necessarily electronics are, are their, is their largest category right now, probably something more in the consumable space. Um, and then they're having these real big challenges around their policies. Prime Pantry was closed, now it's open. I mean, I have a whole list of these things. It, pushing out availability windows, um, you know, and, and then their algorithms. I think if any of us that are doing any paid search advertising on Amazon are really seeing that they don't seem to be accounting super well for products that have a longer lead time associated with them, they're treating them as if they're in stock. So that they've got, they're redirecting a lot of their workforce, they're, um, you know, they've been in the news a lot for their ability or maybe inability to police some of the third party offers. So there's just a lot going on that they're trying to react to. Just all the delays you're experiencing um, as it relates to, um, you know, thinking about the delays that you have in your supply chain, in your workforce, in your production, they're reacting to all of those delays too. And then lastly, this consumer behavior looks really different. And I think that's an interesting um, thing for us to double click on a little bit later. Who is this new consumer and, and how do we really speak to them? So a few of the changes that Amazon has communicated, and this is just, I mean, there's way, probably way more than this. They've put a lot of restrictions around product listings um, for items such, you know, some of these high demand items like masks and, and hand sanitizer. They've been working to prevent third party sellers from price gouging consumers um, and, and in fact restricting some of these listings altogether. And then we've seen some real, where we've seen kind of the biggest shifts is the prior, the size of the orders and the prioritization of products across different product categories and you know it, initially they went out with a message saying we are prioritizing these essential goods and these are the categories but we've certainly seen some adjustments to those policies within the last two weeks so those definitions are definitely in flux but there does seem to be um, some kind of manual prioritization going on as it relates to both ordering from manufacturers and and receiving those orders and then also shipping out to customers so we're seeing things that we know are in stock that are showing on the website availability to ship in like a month or something. They have announced they're delaying Prime Day, restricting vendor powered coupons, and there's probably more to come. This is kind of just as of this morning, um, and I haven't even checked my LinkedIn feed. So lots of changes and, and really a super dynamic environment that is important to stay on top of right now. So what's the impact on some of the manufacturers, some of you in the audience. And I think it depends a lot on what you sell. <laughs> so if you are in the high-end fashion business right now, you're gonna see, you're probably seeing a pretty big drop in sales. Uh, you're getting your products that are deprioritized for inbound and outbound. And I think particularly in the fashion space, we're gonna see some huge manufacturer fallout, meaning you know a lot of these manufacturers aren't gonna be around and there's gonna be some consolidation. Whereas if you are participating in a category that's determined high need, you're, gonna, you're seeing a ton of lift. Um, you're seeing a lot of prioritization from Amazon, actually partnership from vendor managers and divisional managers. And you're also seeing some pretty aggressive competition from an advertising perspective and from a third party listing perspective. So it really depends on what you sell. And the biggest and hardest question that I've gotten in, in the last couple of weeks is, you know, what does the future hold? Like, how do we forecast for this time period? And um, I don't exactly know the answer to that, but I hope that some of the predictions will help you figure that out. So some of the manufacturer impact, I don't, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because I think you are mostly manufacturers, so you probably know how this is impacting your business, but obviously these demand shifts from, from consumers and retailers are pretty dramatic. Um, makes it really hard for you to forecast. You're probably experiencing some form of manufacturing disruption. You know, we have clients where they cannot, um, they cannot produce some of their goods because those factories overseas have transitioned to making things like face masks, um, or you're having potentially some form of disruption, you know, in terms of a, a decreased labor force or, or something happening to you. And then a lot of our manufacturers are experiencing warehouse closures in the United States. So it's obviously really hard to get your product to Amazon if you, your warehouse is not open. 
Um, and then obviously, you know, as this impacts more and more states, transportation is affected as well. Uh, a big concern that some of our manufacturers have is getting paid by some of the retailers that are buying the product right now or have bought a lot of product recently. And that's a real concern as we think about um, all this business, and this is specific more to brick and mortar, but as we think about a lot of this business shifting to online, the, some of these retailers needing to close their doors for a time period and will they reopen? Um, no one knows. And then lastly, figuring out how to address this new e-commerce consumer, you know, specifically on Amazon, the search behavior has radically changed in the last couple of months. And so what used to be a high priority search term is no longer a high priority search term. Um, and you've got, you know, a lot of third party sellers kind of trying to list things in the wrong categories to, to really get around some of Amazon's policies. So how do you deal with this new consumer? Do you need new messaging for them? Who are they? I think the biggest um, impact we've seen across our manufacturer base, aside from changes in demand and supply, is Amazon advertising looking a lot different than it used to. So if you're specifically looking at paid search on Amazon, which is where um, a lot of manufacturers are, have the bulk of their spend, these are some of the things that we're seeing and how we're adjusting for them. So the first is uh, more and lower quality traffic. So we're calling these looky-loos. So these are folks coming to the Amazon site, um, potentially new to Amazon altogether, potentially just new to category, wondering if they can buy it on Amazon. They're not ready yet, but they're just wondering if they can buy it. Is it available? If I don't wanna go to the store, can I get this on Amazon? Um, so they're clicking on all the ads and, uh, and then obviously that's having a significant impact to the advertising conversion rates. And the other reason they may not be buying is it's difficult you know, to assess this programmatically, but there are a lot of products and categories that are showing super long delivery lead times. So they're still showing a prime message. If you click the prime filter, there's, the products are still showing up, but when you get to the product detail page, you see a really, really long lead time for um, delivery. So obviously that's gonna hurt your advertising conversion as well. So way more traffic, um, but, a low, but, but that's really affecting the conversion rates. We're also seeing increased price sensitivity. So, um, and this is particularly true in product categories that aren't high need right now or aren't kind of considered an essential good. Um, and this is you know, where we're seeing some trading down of, of um, consumer shopping behavior from uh, maybe the higher price point product to the lower price point alternative product, whether it's within the same brand's portfolio or a competitive product. So we're certainly seeing that. And then obviously trying to manage through out of stocks and some of your shipping delays is, is a real challenge right now and figuring out how to adjust your advertising appropriately. So we have you know, some clients we're working with and having kind of daily um, calls where we're trying to understand what products do they expect to be in stock soon. Those ones we want to kind of keep some paid search activity going on. If we don't expect to get it back in in a long time, we should shift to products that are um, you know, potentially either in stock with a short availability window, or we know that we'll be able to get more to Amazon soon. And so kind of playing that, um, doing that reprioritization on a real regular basis is important now to kind of protect some of your ad spend. And then lastly, like just figuring out how to be really dynamic in our messaging, and this is not specific to paid search, but um, you know, we have some clients who've done a really nice job pivoting some of their, their advertising messaging to, as I mentioned earlier, pantry stock up or, you know, things to keep you entertained at home. Um, and, and so I think the more that we can find ways to do that, the better. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about our new e-commerce consumer. So... There, there is a lot of research um, being done right now on, on the impact to e COVID-19's impact to e-commerce, but I think the headlines are that we have more people shifting to online, especially first time, so, and especially grocery. Um, you know, of the, the Grocery Dive did a really great study. I highly recommend checking it out. So the, the highlight there is that a lot of these consumers are less familiar with e-commerce. They're just less familiar with Amazon and some of them, a good chunk of them are older. So that really changes how we want to think about um, 
everything from our product assortment <laughs> that we're selling on Amazon um, all the way through to our messaging and and um, and making sure you know that we're addressing kind of any of their um, needs that they have during this time period, as well as questions they may have about your product and thinking about your content on your product detail pages. We talked a little bit about the increased price sensitivity. So this is really just kind of based on economic uncertainty. No one really knows when things are gonna open back up, when they're gonna go back to work. Lots of people have lost their jobs. So this new consumer is more price sensitive. And we're seeing a real willingness to brand switch. Um, and this always happens in times of limited product availability. If the toilet paper you usually buy is not, I mean, how many people have tried a new brand of toilet paper <laughs> in the last couple of weeks? Probably everyone on the call. Um, and, you know, we're going to continue to see that as availability is limited and we see availability challenges um, on Amazon. Lastly, and this is kind of dipping a little bit into our next section on predictions, but I think we're, we're seeing a current situation around these consumers being a lot more DIY. And, you know, that rang true in, um, in the search results where we're seeing, um, you know, consumers searching for hair clippers to give themselves haircuts. I talked to a hair color company the other day who said that their um, demand for hair color is off the charts right now for home hair color. And, uh, and they're going to have to, consumers are going to have to figure out how to fill all of their needs at home. Um, and, and that means different products and different services. So let's talk a little bit about some predictions. I think all of the kind of, um, a lot of industry experts um, are saying a lot of things right now about uh, what's going to happen to commerce and grocery, but the one common theme is that there is a permanent sustained shift to e-commerce that will result coming out of COVID-19. A lot of disagreement about how much of a shift that's going to be um, and that this will really force customers to um, figure out online grocery and not just for customers to figure out online grocery, but this is going to force retailers to figure out online grocery. Um, you know, I haven't on a personal note, I haven't been able to get an Amazon fresh delivery slot in my city for three weeks. Um, so I've been using Fred Meyer's uh, click and collect website. It's, it's not great. Right. And, um, and this is this kind of consumer demand and increased traffic is really what a lot of retailers need to improve their technology and, and figure some of this out. So those are some of the common themes that we're seeing. And thinking about kind of this concept of living a new normal, which is this future state that we're gonna be entering at some point, like what does that mean? Um, I had a conversation with some girlfriends last night where we said, do, do handshakes come back? Like, do people still shake hands after COVID-19? I don't know, we don't really, no one really knows what to expect, but we do know that coming out of COVID-19, we will not be the same as consumers. Um, and so as manufacturers, we need to change as well. And these are some of the predictions um, you know, that I'd like to share around some of the forthcoming consumer trends in the hopes that this helps you think about your product development life, life cycle and some of your brand messaging. Uh, I, I think all experts would agree we come out of this with a really like a higher sensitivity to health, cleanliness, sanitation. Um, unfortunately, I think this also equates to a step backward for um, sustainability in terms of biodegradable cleansers and things like that, but there's really going to be an interest in, in, in virus killing. <laughs> um, turns out a biodegradable cleanser does not kill a deadly virus. So I think we're going to see a little bit of a shift back to, um, you know, some of the traditional methods there. Again, this increased demand for retailer technology. In addition, given the impact that this um, virus has had on so many manufacturing facilities and even Amazon warehouses, I think we're going to see a really uh, an increased demand and innovation around manufacturing automation, warehouse automation. If Amazon did, doesn't have all of their warehouses automated right now, they're certainly going to <laughs> sometime in the near future um, because people get sick and they... Um, you know, and they need to take time off. And, and, and uh, I think this is really showing kind of the reliance on, on people as resources. We'll continue to see evolving workforce policies. I think this is true across things like Amazon's warehouses, but also in our own, um, our own environments. You know, our, my company, for example, transitioned to 100% 
um, digital workforce uh, as soon as we had to close our office. And, you know, this is making us really, it's, it's working really well. It's making us really rethink some of our, our policies around workforce. I'm sure a lot of other companies are doing that as well. You know, that's going to really change how we think about technology, what kind of technology we need, what sort of home technology you need. I think we'll see less travel for a while. Um, I read a stat that said that, you know, post 9-11, it was about, took about 18 months for the airline industry to really rebound, and that was um, not a deadly virus. So I think we'll probably see, you know, a really slow transition back into travel, dining out. I also think we're going to see a pretty big DIY movement coming out of this thing. And, um, and this is, you know, thinking about the kind of two reasons. One is, you know, you've had to really forego a lot of services that you may have been using before COVID-19. Um, in your quarantine living situation and maybe you're learning it's not so bad to do those things on your own or you know maybe you don't mind coloring your hair at home so I think there's going to be kind of a an increased demand for that also coming out of COVID-19 there's a lot of economic uncertainty and obviously that kind of triggers more DIY as well and then I've written, I've read a lot of articles that said that the sharing economy is over, that we won't be doing things like ride sharing and house sharing and clothing sharing. I don't know that that's true. I think it's just, I think it's just going to look a lot different. And we don't know what that means yet, but I think it's going to look different. So let's talk about commerce specifically. Um, and then we'll, and then we'll talk a little bit about Amazon specifically. So first, you know, we know consumer behavior is going to change forever. Um, I think the, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the shift to online, consumer behavior changing for good, uh, shift to shift to e-commerce. Um, this is really also a chance for manufacturers uh, and retailers to have are kind of forced to have a digital connection with their consumers, um, and we're seeing because it's it's you know, the impact of that out of, outside of home advertising is, a little, is lower right now. No one's outside of their home. And so a lot of that advertising I have been reading is shifting to digital channels. So you as manufacturers are having to learn really quickly um, and under fire how to communicate directly with your consumers, whether that's through social channels or other digital advertising that you're participating in. And then one thing we're seeing with our manufacturers, unfortunately, is for some of where we, where we see a large manufacturer running out of stock or not having availability, we see a really fast uptick in the sales um, going to more upstart brands. Some of the more upstart brands are potential, not always, but a lot of the time more nimble. They're able to pivot their supply chains more quickly. They're able to launch new products more quickly. Um, and, and they're taking some of those sales from some of the more established brands that are out of stock. And so I think that's going to result in some, some permanency in some of that brand loyalty. So let's think a little bit about Amazon um, and, then, and then we'll wrap up for some questions because I see some coming in on the, on the questions right now. First, um, what, what does this look like for Amazon? They've done a lot of pivoting, a lot of adapting. Um, they're getting to show us how they can pivot their business really quickly. And what does this look like for them long term? And I think, you know, while I think no one, no one, including Amazon, would ever wish for something like COVID-19, they certainly only stand to benefit, and not just in their retail channel, but across a lot of their um, segments of their business. So first, this obviously gives them a stronger foothold in grocery and healthcare. I think it's also going to give them a really strong foothold in fashion. They have been waiting in the wings for their opportunity to really have, um, you know, a strong foothold in that category. And coming out of COVID-19, I don't think a lot of fashion retailers are going to make it. I think that Amazon's going to have a higher degree of success convincing brands to sell on their platform. And I think some of those sales are going to shift to Amazon what that looks like and whether that's the same brands that people care about now, I don't know, but I know that they will see some long-term sustained growth in their fashion category as a result of, of COVID-19 and the fallout. The thing that probably matters the most for people on this call thinking forward, um, if we can kind of get out of the, how are we going to fill our purchasers right now and how do we um, continue to survive through COVID long-term, 
Amazon's shifted their sales mix to much less profitable categories. So, um, and for two reasons, one, they're selling a lot of consumable product, which is a lower margin. Those are lower margin product categories for them. So that inc decreases the company's overall retail profitability. Um, but we also talked about the increased price sensitivity. So consumers are trading down a bit in terms of the products that they're buying. So what does that mean for you in six months as a manufacturer? It probably means that that pendulum swift that we see at Amazon from profitability to growth to profitability to growth is certainly going to swing towards profitability. In addition to kind of those two trends that I just mentioned, they're having to increase they're having to hire a lot of new workers and train them. They're having to increase protocols within their fulfillment centers. They're having to rely on some short-term solutions um, that are probably expensive to get products to consumers and get workers you know, in the door. And so that all affects their profitability as well. So expect, <laughs> expect some profit challenges for Amazon in the future, which unfortunately is going to hurt some of your negotiations with them. Also coming out of this, I think Amazon is realizing that partnership's important. And I, I don't say that sarcastically. Um, you know, Amazon has, has long proved themselves to be a pretty self-service platform. Even some of the largest brands and manufacturers that sell on Amazon, I don't think they would say that they have, um, you know, a, a really uh, strong partnership with Amazon relative to other retailers. So Amazon's figuring out that in order to get inventory in right now, they have to be flexible. They have to figure out how to partner with manufacturers. And I think that trend's going to continue to some degree. Um, it's also forcing them to really get smarter about policing the third party marketplace fast. You know, we saw that with price gouging. Um, you know, we, we have seen it in the past as it relates to counterfeit and, um, you know, lookalike kind of, kind of goods. So I hope that this, um, gives them an opportunity to really focus some resources on that. I think we'll see a wave of digital innovation from them um, throughout COVID-19 and coming out of COVID-19. When you think about the concept of restricted living, it means that we are all accessing, we're watching more movies on Prime, we are accessing more cloud storage, we're engaging with our home devices like Alexa a lot more often, and all of those things help support Amazon, but not only does it help support them, it gives them a ton of data. I would also guess that their healthcare pilot that they're doing with their employees is seeing a lot of action right now. Um, so I think, you know, coming out of this, they have a wealth of data and hopefully, you know, they'll do some great things with it in terms of home, home connectivity and, um, you know, healthcare and figuring out how to, how to break down some of the barriers there making that a little bit more um, consumer friendly and cost effective. And then, you know, really figuring out, you know, how to even, even in terms of movie production, like what are some of the, the trends that they're learning about right now? What are they gonna come up with? This is forcing them to strengthen their supply chain, increase robotics in the warehouses. And then lastly, I think this lets Amazon be a hero um, and they need to be a hero right now. Uh, if you look just over the last six months pre-COVID, um, they were rated the number one most hated company by Slate.com. Uh, it's worth noting that the other most hated companies were Uber, Microsoft, Apple, <laughs> like all the stuff that we use all the time, Facebook. Um, but I think this gives them an opportunity to service customers when they really need it, to you know, be available to distribute medical supplies, to you know, make it so that a lot of us don't have to go to physical stores and, and risk our health. And so this really gives them an opportunity to improve their brand image long term. Um, and I think we can expect to see that as well. So those are, our, um, those are our topics for today. I won't walk through this next slide in a ton of detail, but I get asked a lot. Um, and we get asked at IdeaClick who we're following, what we're reading. And this is a very abbreviated list. I obviously read a lot of things, but this is, these are, this is my short list. Um, for how I'm staying kind of current on COVID-19 impact to commerce and e-commerce. And, um, you know, a couple of um, great sites that provide some geographical coverage, which may help you with some of your geographical forecasting. These are my favorite sites for tracking consumer trends, and they have done some great studies, and they've been really fast to get them out, um, which has been really helpful. And then just kind of three, I follow a lot of people, but these are the three that tend to be posting the most. Um, 
Jason kind of about Jason Goldberg kind of about general e-commerce and he has a podcast as well. And then two reporters that are very Amazon specific in, in nature and um, stay on top of kind of all of the changes at Amazon. So this is my short list and I hope that, that it is useful to you. So that wraps up some of the um, pre presented content and I'm going to stop the share right now and we can take some questions from the group. I tried to allow a little bit more time than usual because I know we probably have a lot of questions. We do. Thanks, Andrea, for your partnership in this area and especially for enlightening us and what's going on in e-com, especially focused around, around Amazon. Uh, we, we have a number of questions. I have um, a few printed out and a few online as well. So let's go ahead and get to those. Uh, looks like we have about 15 minutes or so to try to get through some of these. Uh, and I'll, answer, is, I'll answer as many as I can. If there are some questions that stump me or I need to refer to a subject matter expert at IdeoClick, um, I've left my contact information on here and, and you're welcome to reach out. That's great. Great. Uh, well, one of our viewers is actually asking, how did they get in contact with you? And uh, <laughs> are you able to actually share the deck? So um, yes. That, that would be great. We really appreciate that. So feel free to reach out to Andrea. I know, Andrea, you had your contact information up on screen a little bit earlier. And for those who are looking for the deck, and if you did miss some of Andrea's contact information, um, next week, this is being recorded. Next week, this will actually go up and you can feel free to come back and watch it again and reshare it uh, with others. Or uh, you can get Andrea's contact information and reach out to her directly for that PowerPoint deck. So let's go ahead and, and jump into this. Uh, first one, Andrea says, why do they have lead times after you click? That is really annoying. As a shopper, besides a manufacturer, it's a time waster, isn't it? Is that something that you think will change? And I, I have a feeling that question is coming from some of the lag time that, that shoppers are experiencing on the platform at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is annoying. I think we're seeing a lot of things on Amazon that are kind of annoying and, uh, and we're, you realize like how spoiled we've been as consumers, mm -hmm. right? Like you sure. order it, a lot of locales have same day prime now um, or one day prime. In Seattle, we can get a lot of things just same day, which is great. Um, but you realize when you start to try to shop at some of the other e-commerce sites that how unique that is. <laughs> and I think now, you know, it's really been challenged. We've I mean, I think consumers are experiencing a lot of like missed promise dates and extended delays and things like that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think, I do think a lot of it's short term. I think uh, COVID-19 caught them and everyone else by surprise. So I do believe that they're working hard to kind of get those algorithms to be smarter. But I think initially, if I understand how Amazon operates, they probably set a top-down directive that said, push out availability on everything except these essential goods. We want to keep all the lanes clear to receive and set and ship toilet paper, face mask, you know, whatever the, the high demand goods are and some um, shelf stable pantry items. We have seen them open up more and more categories for ordering and for prioritization. And some of those lead times are getting a little bit shorter. Um, but you know, it's important to remember Amazon only keeps two weeks of inventory in stock mm. and they, you know, for a lot of these types of product categories, they don't, they are not doing very much volume. I mean, if you think of sure. something like automotive category, it's less than like 5%. <laughs> Right, right. Is on e is on line anyway, and then Amazon has a super small percentage of that. So they they're running real thin. But I think this is going to give them an opportunity to get smarter about the forecasting for sure. Well, and some of that comes into the you know looking at the manufacturing sector. What's under fire right now is the just just in time um, type manufacturing processes and Six Sigma and all that type of thing, where you have absolutely lean manufacturing. Yeah. That has really come to take a negative effect. It's it's great for bottom line when you have predictability, but it can account for crises like this. So it's going to cause all these manufacturers, both in the product sector, automotive, and everywhere, to rethink some of this, I think, in the future. On the flip side, if you're a fashion manufacturer and you've already committed to all of your production, um, you know, talking about an industry that has a super long lead time, like that's a really tough spot to be in right now. Sure. Agreed. Uh, Tim is asking, Andrea, can you speak to the impact of Amazon Fresh and how consumers may ship to this channel post COVID-19? I think you touched on that a little bit. Well, there's a yeah. lot of frustration from consumers today. Will that have effect on loyalty and will it continue to see a spike in new people coming through to that? 
I think it really depends on what happens with some of the other online grocery delivery and click and collect options. So right now, you know, I think most people would be willing to go give cut Amazon fresh a break <laughs> for, for lack of better um, phrase, you know, because you, it's not like you can go to Kroger or whatever and get a sl delivery slot or a, um, pick up slot earlier. So everyone's impacted. But I think if some of, and this is where I think there's a real opportunity for other retailers to kind of come in and do that. Um, you know, other retailers, particularly in grocery, have way more scale than Amazon. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think there's a real opportunity for them to uh, get super smart and and innovate quickly in the on those, um, you know, any of their platforms that don't make customers go into the store. So whether that's buy online, pick up in store, um, even some of the cashier list checkout, I think is getting a lot more action right now. Um, you know, to tap to pay, like any of the technology that retailers can put in place now, I think helps them get a leg up on Amazon. This next question from Catherine really speaks on two different sides. Uh, here at GMDC, we see a real push from our retail members for made in USA products, and, and this is really where this is going. For new, for the new e-com consumer, how do you feel about all the knockoffs and as well as the overseas sellers? And how does the price impact that? And really consumers are looking for authenticity. And quite frankly, there's a bit of a negative cloud over the made in China label right now. Uh, what are you seeing on the on the Amazon platform? I think it depends a lot on the product category. So for high need categories, we've seen um, consumers be, show a lot less preference. You know, if you need if you need toilet paper or you need rice or flour to stock your pantry, or if you need um, you know a webcam or whatever it is, you have an urgent need. Um, you're going to care less about where it's coming from. Like you have to fill your need. But where you have more discretion, I think you're certainly right. There's um, when you have more options, when there are other manufacturers in stock. Um, you know, you're willing to to really put some of your principles forward and sure, sure. and choose based on that. So I think as we move through these phases of consumer demand, whatever the high need product is, we're going to see more tolerance for that and whatever the low need product is. I think long term, um, I don't know how this will impact kind of things made overseas. Like the whole world has been impacted. So even if your products are made in the U.S., um, you're impacted. So it's hard to say what will happen long term. Yeah, makes sense. Um, another question, uh, Andrea, can you talk a little bit more about seller central versus versus vendor central and which to focus on in the Amazon? Um, so I think, again, it depends on if you're a high need good or not. If your products are in those categories that Amazon's prioritizing right now, either is either is fine. Um, you know, I think most important is getting consumers a fast delivery. So if that's through your retail account or if that's through your uh, FBA account, whichever one is, is driving the volume for you right now is great. I think if you're in a non-essential category, now is the time to set up third-party fulfillment <laughs> because Amazon's not ordering from you, or at least they're not from all of the non-essential goods clients we have who are ordering very small amounts and having really long delivery, even for some of them that are in stock, having these really long delivery windows. So if you can ship to consumers yourself or you can get that up and going and we um we have a solution um that we can connect people to as well to do drop ship on your behalf that is a great and you and that's economically viable for you i think that's a great thing to get up and going great well, time for one oh another question just popped in but let, let's go back to this other question um i think this is a this sounds like it's a manufacturer asking about amazon's terms and conditions um, knowing that some of these manufacturers who are selling on Amazon have a higher cost of overhead because of cleaning, because of everything else that, that's going on right now, how understanding is Amazon towards some of those higher operation costs that some of these sellers are experiencing? And, um, you know, is Amazon being fair in dealing with some of the companies knowing that they're having a hard time getting some of their products through and they have more overhead even just due to cleaning? and you know, struggling with uh, with employees and that type of thing right now. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, similar to kind of when we underwent all the tariff increases, Amazon's pushed us back pretty hard on all any kind of cost increases or like burden sharing because they have their own cost structure that they're 
you know, struggling with here as well. So I think we'll be, see them be the last retailer to be willing to um, be forgiving about that. What we are seeing them be uncharacteristically, un, uncharacteristically forgiving about our lead times for products. So where they used to slap you with a big charge back if you know the carrier didn't show up in time or whatever, they're being they're allowing a lot more grace for for some of that in as it relates to chargebacks and things like that. Interesting. I think we have time for one more question. Is there any if uh, is there any way to affect Amazon's category prioritizations? Has anyone had success in getting Amazon to re reprioritize a category or an ASIN? We do think they're doing some whitelisting at an actual item level in some cases. So I think if you were to bring that case, if you were in a position where you have a point of contact at Amazon or a vendor manager, if you could bring a case to make a case to them that your products are selling really well in other retailers right now, how they're addressing a need in that consumer um, phases of demand that we talked about earlier, um, and how, you know, and maybe even pulling in some of your, if the product's out of stock on Amazon, some of the replenishable out of stock data to show them like the impact um, and the lost sales opportunity, I think they'd be willing to consider it. Great. Andrea, thanks again for your time today. We appreciate you being part of this infocast. Great. Thank you for having me, Mark. Back to our audience, if this is your first time experiencing a GMDC Retail Tomorrow Infocast, I'd like to make sure that you're aware that this session and all previous Infocast events can be viewed on the Archive tab on gmdcconnect.org, along with a schedule to register for future Infocast. I'd also like to encourage to get involved with our association and become a member. Today's Infocast is a small sample of what members have access to. GMDC Retail Tomorrow is a nonprofit retail-owned association that helps you connect your people and companies to growth and opportunity in the general merchandise, health, beauty, wellness, and self-care industries. For more information, please contact me at markm at gmdc.org or come back to the GMDC Connect site to be able to get Andrea Lay's contact information as well. Thanks for joining us today. Stay safe, keep washing your hands, and I hope you're all wearing fashionable face masks. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.